Okay. Um, the paper you have read, I think, is the paper uh, on uh, published in uh, the research of political economy, right? Because that uh, that paper is the English and changed version of a paper I published in Italian in a philosophical journal, Phenomenologia e Società, Phenomenology and Society. Uh, it, uh, it is a, a journal of the Jesuits, actually, because when uh, in, uh, everywhere in the world after the crisis of 2007 and 2008, there was a discussion about Marx and the crisis. This, especially uh, for sociologists, but even more economists, did happen in academic journals. They were the priests and the Catholics who were interested in doing these things. And there was an exceptional uh, uh, Jesuit, Padre Giuseppe Pirola, Padre Giuseppe Pirola, who organized uh, a series of seminars and then uh, a special issue on Marx Renaissance. I don't like very much the term, but well, this was the topic. Uh, Padre Giuseppe Pirola was in Padua. I say he was because unfortunately he died in uh, one year, one year and a half after this. And the, the, the thing was uh, mostly organized by Massimiliano Tomba, who is an Italian philosopher. You probably know, if you don't know, you will know, I think, because it's worldwide. He has just published a book on Marx for Brill. And uh, I, I was called by an Italian publisher from Trieste, he's a Greek, Asterios, who told me, do you want to publish it as a small book, 70 pages, 7 euros? And they said yes, also because the original paper was longer than the one which was published. The English version is the long one, because I asked Peter Thomas to translate it, the shorter version, because of an issue of money. Peter translated the entire paper, so I paid more, but afterwards I'm happy it was translated the, 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 longer, the longer one. Actually, some of you, I think, will come tomorrow to, to listen to another talk on the European crisis uh, and, and so on. And uh, it has also been published by the same publisher, Asterios, because when he, he, he proposed me this one, 70 pages, 7 euros, I thought, but do I want to go out uh, in 2012 with a small book just on theoretical matters, or almost just on theoretical matters? And they proposed him something on the global crisis and the European crisis. And I thought to do just one book of 140 pages. He, he told me, no, I will publish it. Another small book, 70 pages, 7 euros. So <laughs> that's how it went. But he was right. The, 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 the formula worked. So what I think to do uh, here, also because the trip was very long and I had not, not the time to, to prepare myself properly, is to give you a, the structure of my paper that probably you have read. So you will have a lot of, of uh, objections. Because usually my papers have one problem. I, when I, I write for Marxian journals, I'm not too Marxian. When I write for Keynesian journals, I am too Marxian. Uh, and uh, you know that I, I, I had a joke that I did in December 2007 in Dijon. I was in a post-Keynesian conference. And uh, I was a couple of weeks before at the London History Historical Materialism uh, Conference. And they said, you see, when I go to a, a Marxian conference, I realize how much I am a Canadian. When I go to a Canadian conference, I realize how much I am a 
Marxian. So that's that's my problem. But I was raised as a my, my first contact with the political economy was uh, through Claudio Napoleone. Claudio Napoleone, was, in the period I, I, I learned political economy, was, was a Marxian who tried to put together philosophy and uh, political economy in a non-standard way, but recovering, so rescuing the labor theory value without dividing the philosophical side from the political economy side. This was a, a thing that he did only for a few years. Then he abandoned this perspective and he went into a kind of Marcusian Heideggerian division between the two that I don't agree with. But uh, my main printing has been with, uh, with him. And so I did my dissertation with him on Rosa Luxemburg. And during the dissertation on Rosa Luxemburg, I built a discourse on uh, on crisis theories. And in fact, the, the first one third of this uh, paper and book is the discourse on the crisis as I built uh, at the time. That is, we are 75, 76, that, that when I wrote my, my dissertation. So the first part of the, of the small book and of, of the paper you have read is uh, a kind of survey of the Marxian theory of the crisis, huh? especially if you, you put yourself in the debate uh, late 60s, early 70s, the discussion of the crisis was contrasting an interpretation of the crisis which was known as a as profit squeeze because of an increase of wages. Uh, there was, of course, the falling, the traditional interpretation of the falling rate of profit. And there was, of course, uh, the interpretation of the crisis as a kind of underconsumption crisis. You can also put names with this. So I think the best version of the uh, profit squeeze view was the one put forward by Glean and Sutcliffe for the UK experience. There were similar authors uh, in Italy. They were more influenced by Zraffa than uh, than Green and Sutcliffe. Then at the time the interpretation about the falling rate of profit probably the best author was Paul Matic, the father. Then the realization crisis. At the time probably the, 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 the version of the other consumptionist view was the Paul Sweezy and monthly review. Montreal review tradition. Now, uh, I start from the Glyn Sack view, the profit squeeze uh, view. No? The, the idea is to start from chapter 23rd, or at least of the fourth German edition, which is also the Italian translation. I don't know here how it is because the, the English use the third edition, so it's I think three, three chapters, three chapters more. Uh, the argument is more or less this in, in that chapter. You start assuming a constant composition of uh, of capital. There is accumulation. This means that the value invested uh, is going up and up. This will uh, uh, create a, a pressure on the supply, uh, on the labor supply. Uh, making the labor market uh, more favorable to, to workers. So at a certain point, the wage rate goes up and uh, profits are squeezed. Uh, of course, at this point, you have a slowing down of accumulation and a slowing down of the uh, labor demand, and you have a cycle. Uh, this is just the beginning of the chapter because, of course, after a while, you have the fact that when there is this uh, this process and the profit squeeze, capitalists react uh, through a, the introduction of uh, machines. This means that the composition of capital goes up, and this means that you need to to 
consider two forces. One is the increase in the rate of uh, accumulation, and, uh, and the other is the fact that the introduction of, of machines may decrease the increase of labor, of labor demand. According to the, the balance of the two things, you may have a cycle, a cycle in which the, the, the wage goes up and down through the cycle, and so profits goes down and up through the cycle. This was actually very, very much used in the 60s and 70s from people from different sides, uh, uh, also coming from, uh, from Zraffa, as I told you, but also coming from Keynes, etc. Uh, my point is that uh, this interpretation of the chapter 23rd as a cycle theory, as a, and even as a crisis theory, was wrong because the problem of Marx in that chapter was uh, a criticism of Malthus' law of, uh, of, of population. Uh, this does not mean that the chapter is not interesting. One can look at the way uh, Rosa Luxemburg looked at, at the wage theory in Marx. Uh, now, I, I don't know if you ever came across the introduction to political economy of Rosa Luxemburg, uh, because the, this book was translated in Italian, in France, but not in English. In English, it is translated, it will be translated probably this year, in the collected, uh, collected writings. So, the people writing in English know about the, the chapter on the wage only through Rozdowski's. Uh, Rozdowski make a good summary of the position by Rosa Luxemburg on the wage in Marx. The position of Rosa Luxemburg is that uh, uh, in Marx you have a law of the tendential fall in the wage. Rosa Luxemburg's view was that the accumulation of capital is producing a, a squeeze of, uh, sorry, uh, the accumulation of capital is producing an increase in relative surplus value. The increase in the relative surplus value may be seen as a squeeze of the share of the value of labor power in the total value, value produced. This for here is, uh, let us speak in this way, of the essence of capital. Uh, the squeeze of the relative wage, because this is the term that she uses, because sometimes Marx uses this term which is of Ricardian origin, the squeeze of the relative wage can go on for her, as for Marx, together with the rise of the relative wage. So she is against a, a too easy way of, uh, of arguing in favor of the miseration tendencies because of the uh, lowering, lowering down, lowering down of, the real, of the real wage. However, in her view, it is possible even that there is a rise in the, in the money wage, which gives way to a rise in the real wage, which is higher than the uh, productive power of labor. So you can have a period in which the ready wage goes up. But this has limits because Breaking the law, the tendential fall in the relative wage for her, it is not really possible because it is breaking a law in capitalism. Uh, so, actually, Rosa Luxemburg would not have accepted a Raffian interpretation of Marx on the wage because Raffians in the 70s, when I was writing this kind of things, were thinking that actually uh, it was possible, whatever kind of struggle over distribution, it is just a political resistance of capitalists, not a, an economic law of capitalists. Talking of economic laws, according to Raffians, was to uh, fell prey of uh, neoclassical theorizing. Uh, another criticism I had for the profit squeeze view was the fact that they, uh, they were not realizing 
that for Marx there was a more fundamental reason for having a, uh, an introduction of machines, which has not to do the more fundamental reason with the, the, uh, uh, the fact that capitalists introduce machines as a reaction to worker struggles on the wage. This may happen, of course, but the fundamental reason has to do with the interaction of capitalist competition and the struggle of capital as a whole against workers. The two themes are very important in Marx in Medellin because the struggle of competition, this is the by Marx, is, uh, let me put it in this way, uh, Schumpeter before Schumpeter. Actually, Schumpeter was, uh, as you know, a, a close reader of Marx. And when he wrote the preface for the Japanese uh, readers of his theory of economic development, this preface has been made available to the English readers only one decade ago. In Italian, it is there since since the 60s and 70s, he was writing, you know, uh, I have not to explain to you, Jambres readers, that my main heroes are two, Valras and Marx. Valras, for the logic of economic reasoning, it was thinking of the circular flow, and Marx because of intracapitalist competition, the competition of one capitalist against, against, uh, against the other. Of course, Schumpeter had the problem that his hero was the was the entrepreneur. So he had this kind of Nietzschean view of the entrepreneur as the as, as the prime mover. But the, if, if you skip this aside, so to speak, the two theories of competition are very 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 similar. His theory of competition of Schumpeter is mostly the theory that Marx has in Chapter Ten of the first book of Capital against Ford fourth edition. Uh, but the point in Marx in chapter 10, and look it is important that because the first book has no place for competition, one may say. But no, Marx had to put competition in the first book of Capital. Why? Because that competition is actually implementing what Capital is in its essence and uh, it is the fact that capital as a whole needs to introduce machines to control labor from workers. Uh, I have to come back to this point later on because for now I'm using labor in a very generic way which is the way even most, the most sophisticated uh, readers of Marx do. They do not distinguish very much the meaning of labor in Marx. In my interpretation, Marx actually in, uh, distinguished and was coherent in his way of speaking of the different dimensions of labor only, maybe not even in the first edition, but in the second edition of the first book of Capital, so relatively, relatively late. Take the Grundrisse, from that point of view, it is a fascinating book, but when speaking of labor, it is a mess. Right? You have, in my view, to interpret it backwards, that is, using the categories of capital and going back to read, uh, to read, uh, to read the Grundrisse. This may explain some problems I had with uh, readers of my paper and even with the very kind and thoughtful person who helped me putting this paper in a decent English and she is Radhika Desai, but in my view she didn't get the importance of these distinctions and even of some Hegelian foundations in my in my paper. Uh, but I don't want to go into this just now. I just want to say that from here, of course, you can go on towards the Marx falling 
rate of profit tendency. Because the argument of Marx is that capital is the contradiction in movement because uh, uh, to, to gain labor from workers it has to introduce machines, but machines expel workers. And workers are the source of value, a new value. Mm -hmm. And this is actually the foundation of the falling rate of profit tendency. The traditional way of talking of the falling rate of profit, pro profit in, uh, in Marxism, and it is something which can be traced back to the same of Marx, uh, is to say that during accumulation, the organic composition of capital goes up. And when the organic composition of capital goes up, the rate of profit, sooner or later, must go down. There is a well-known criticism to this argument. The well-known criticism has been put forward by John Robinson and by Paul Sweezy. And the argument is, if you frame the argument in terms of the composition of capital, uh, it is in the denominator of the rate of profit. What do you have in the numerator? You have the rate of surplus value. But as the same Marx shows in the third book of capital, when the composition of capital goes up, also the rate of surplus value has to go up. Yes, Marx starts assuming the rate of surplus value is given, but then he shows that it is not so. The increase in the rate of surplus value is one in, of the counter tendencies, but there is no reason to see it as just a counter tendency. It is something which goes on together with the composition of capital. Do I have to go on or? Uh, and the rate of, of surplus value may go up more than the increase of the composition of capital. This is an intelligent criticism in my view, and it has had a, a, an intelligent answer from intelligent readers of capital, actually like Paul Matic, but also other people like Mario Kogoi and others. I rationalize their argument in this way. You can uh, look and strangely as it may seem, Straffa had a similar kind of argument in the late, in the early 40s. Huh? And, uh, and the argument may, may be put forward through the categories of the production of commodities by means of commodities which is of the 60s. The idea is the following. We can look at the rate, at the composition of capital in a different way than usual. Usually it is cost of capital over variable capital. But we can look at the composition of capital as something having cost of capital in the numerator and all the new value in the, 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 in the denominator. Uh, that is variable capital plus uh, surplus value, which is actually the monetary expression of the new value coming from the living labor. If you invert this version of the capital composition, what do you have? You have the maximum rate of profit. So if the constant capital in the denominator goes up with a given population, even if they have zero wage rate, and even if they have uh, the maximum 24 hours <laughs> exploitation, it is, of course, a crazy experiment, but it is a logical experiment. You may say the denominator has a limit, no, the numerator, the, the, the living labor expressed in, uh, in money has a limit, but the denominator, the cost of capital, has not a limit. So at a certain point, the maximum rate of profit has to fall. And if the maximum rate of profit falls, at a certain point, the effective rate of profit falls. Now, here I have my objections to, as I am with the profit squeeze idea. 
The objection is uh, the following. First, we have to go and look what is the meaning of composition of capital, because everybody uses organic composition of capital. I think that they don't look as they are defined, really, in Marx. Marx has three notions of composition, composition of capital. One is technical composition of capital. It is important, but it, it is something which speaks of machines and means of production on one side, workers on the other side, they are not something which can be accounted for. What Marx thinks is that accumulation makes means of production and machines more important relative to workers. What Marx says, okay, but what happens, what, what, what matters for capitalists? For capitalists, what matters is the value composition of capital. That is, the value expression of means of production on one side and the value that can be extracted from variable capital. Variable capital is an index of the value, new value, which can be extracted from workers. And what is the organic composition of capital here? The organic composition of capital is defined by Marx as the movement in the value composition position of capital as long as they follow the movement in the technical composition of capital. This has to be interpreted somehow. My interpretation, which actually follows the interpretation of Ben Fine uh, in the 70s when he wrote together with Lawrence Harris, and more or less he, he says the same with Alfredo Salfio, etc., is that actually you may look at the uh, organic composition of capital as the value composition of capital before taking into account the effect of innovations because innovations went into the devaluation of work of uh, variable capital but also of, uh, uh, of cost and capital. Uh, your, this is the organic composition of capital before the innovation, which gives way to these devaluations. If you take into account these devaluations, what do you have? Do you have the value composition of capital? So what I'm saying is what matters for the capital is the value composition of capital after the innovation. So Sweezy and Robinson were not so wrong. But yes, there is the other argument problematic argument, which is an important argument, I think. But that argument is not definitive, because, of course, if you take into account the devaluation of the cost of capital, it affects also the maximum rate of profit. So you can say anymore that the maximum rate of profit is falling down. Uh, I have an important use in my, in my paper on Paul-Matic. Actually, I've written lately something on Paul Sweezy and Paul Matic, which are the two opposite sides of the debate of, of, of the early 70s, late 60s, early 70s, if you wish, in which, uh, provocatively enough, uh, I'm saying that both were wrong relative to the crisis of the 70s, but both were right in important things. And I will say later, probably in what they were they were right. So this is about the falling rate uh, of profit. Then you have the realization crisis. Here I'll try to be quicker. The realization crisis is a crisis which may happen in two different ways. This is the, 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 the traditional way of putting it by Swiss in 42. You have this proportionality crisis, the line taken by Hilferding, by Lenin in a sense, uh, Bukharin, etc. And you have, say, Sweezy, the under-consumptionist view. Sweezy is very much influenced by an article by Kowski, 1905, Krizan Theoria, 
I was very lucky because in the 60s and 70s almost everything was translated in Italian, including Christian, Christian uh, theory. So I read it. It, it didn't make to me the same impression that it made to Sweezy for some reason. Sweezy is very nasty towards Rosa Luxemburg, following the criticism of Bukhari. Now, Rosa Luxemburg was excited when she wrote The Accumulation of Capital. She said that she wrote it as in trance in four months, and that she never reread the draft. And really, no, the draft would have been useful, I think. At the same time, the critics, maybe they are right in every single detail, but they lose <coughs> the big picture. And they think that the big picture, she had more, uh, more uh, attention than the, than the critics to important things. And paradoxically enough, the, the argument of Rosa Luxemburg was better understood by people who were not really considered Marxist by the Marxists. One was again John Robinson. Probably John Robinson was the best in interpreting. Rosa Luxemburg, in her introduction of 52 to the English translation of the Operation of Capital, the other one was Mikhail Kaleski. Kaleski was a Polish economist who reached the same conclusion even before reading, actually, Rosa, Rosa Luxemburg. But later on, they, 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 he came back to, to, to this debate and wrote two very important articles articles in 67 and 60, 68, going through all this debate. My point is Rosa Luxemburg was not another conceptionist. She was an, another investment theorist. She knew very well that for Marx, under consumption is not a cause of the crisis. Yes, of course, you had the famous phrase, the uh, underconsumption of the masses is the last reason of every crisis. I think that people does not understand the phrase, have not read what is before, have not read what is after, probably have not read Marx, <laughs> or oh, very cursory e enough. Because the phrase means that it does not explain any crisis, because it explains every crisis. So her problem, as Kaleski's problem, as some left Keynesian problem, in my view even Keynes' problem, was not that the wage is not enough to buy, to buy the old output. Uh, Luxembourg was not a new Malthus in a female form inside Marxism. Her view, uh, the, the, the problem was why investments transform for a while and then collapse. She had the idea that there is a lack in incentive uh, for investment at a certain point. And this is not just due to consumption. You can see it very easily. In her book, she made of all the solutions to the crisis. And uh, sorry, this is my friend. That's uh, the she destroys every answer which is based just on the fact that there is an increase in consumption coming from the third persons, or etc. Because for her, the solution to the crisis can only be capitalist investment, not consumption. So she can be another, another consumptionist. Then we may say that she was not good enough in framing uh, in framing an under-interventionist, uh, an under-investment view. But that's another thing all, uh, all together. In my view, she opened the way to a very interesting uh, stream of thought, which takes the schemes of reproduction, shows that the schemes of reproduction explains how capitalism can provide demand to uh, itself, uh, but shows that at a certain point, this does not work uh, anymore. In a view, in a sense, I think that in the Grudrisse, 
Martin knew very well these schemes of reproduction in the good risk, we, we know. But if you go at the beginning of the part on circulation in the good risk, you have a very, very interesting framing of the argument, which may be linked to Luxembourg, not the Luxembourg of the population of capital, but the Luxembourg of the introduction of political inequality. The argument is the following. Marx is saying, look, uh, cap capitalism is based on an attempt to go beyond any limit. This means having more and more sectors of production. As long as you have more sectors of production, you, are, you have more points of demand inside capitalism. But it is not a law of capitalism that uh, this increase of the rate of exploitation and then of what he call the disproportionality of uh, living labor or necessary labor is uh, translated into a kind of planet economy. So at a certain point, there will be disproportionalities coming from an increase in the rate of surplus value. And these disproportionalities will lead uh, sooner or later to imbalances. You may say disproportionality crises, but when these disproportionality crises are so huge in some sectors to create an excess of uh, supply or demand, they will degenerate into a uh, effective demand uh, demand uh, crisis. This looks quite sensible to me. Here I stop with the survey. Then the paper in the version published in uh, in the book. has two movements. The second movement is not in the philosophical Italian journal, but it is in, uh, I think, in uh, research in political economy. Uh, the two movements are, first, I say, look, we can look at these different three theories of crisis as one theory. That is, we can put the three things together. This is not something that Marx does. If you wish, it, it is something in the way of rational reconstruction. But it can be done, and it can be done inside a labor theory of value perspective. The second movement, which is likely because Peter Thomas translated it, and so I paid him more, but I'm happy now to pay him more. Uh, and in the book is to say, look, I can have this reading of Marx because I lived an historical experience in the 60s and 70s. That is, I totally agree with Karl Korsch that Marxism, I would say Marxian approaches, have to historicize themselves every time we read it. And Marx has this kind of property, which is not there because he was a prophet, but because I think he built a good theoretical uh, instrumentation for analyzing capitalism, that he can tell us more than he saw. In my view, he has something of this idea in mind, that he he had no final word, but he has this kind of instrumentation. Because when the journalists, uh, I don't know if journalists of France, comrades, went in London, late 70s, asking him, but why don't you publish the, the, the second book of Carly? Because the title was the Probably some of you know the, answers, uh, the answer. And the answer was, I can't do that, because there is a, a big crisis in England. And if it is not finished, I can say anything. So my point about Marxianism is that Marx was a critic of political economy of their time, so political economy must be every time redefined. It is not stopped in, uh, in 1830. Second, it is a critic of political economy because it was to be a critic of the capitalism of our times. So what Marx would do now would not be there compulsive. Just what he wrote 
but confronting is instrumentation of this kind, this kind of thing. So my argument is, 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 is the following, and it is articulated with an historical, long view perspective of capitalism. What they say is, look at the rate of profit formula. Let us put it historically. I start with what I call the Great Depression, or better, the Long Depression. For me, the Great Depression is not the one of the 1930s, because I studied in the 60s and 70s. And in the 60s and 70s, in the book I read, the Great Depression was the Long Depression. The Long Depression was the crisis of the late 19th century. Go and look at the books by Dove, for example, of Joseph Gilman on the rate of profit, etc. And the idea was that Long Depression can be explained through the traditional rate of profit falling according to Marx. The statistical data more or less support it. And this, even the critic of the falling rate of profit says, like Joseph Gilman is one of them. Uh, my, my, my discourse then goes on saying the crisis of capitalism is not just the death of something, but it is a transformation in, into a new form of accumulation. Capitalism reacted through technological and organizational innovation, among other things, because it was justification, etc. But also through Fordism and Taylorism. I put them in this order because I think that the workerist interpretation going from Taylorism to Fordism is wrong. Taylorism for me is a nickname for the many technological or organizational innovations of the uh, early 20th century and in itself it was a failure because it was the increase of the rate of exploitation having the competition of capital fixed. Mm -hmm. This has a problem. It makes transparent the struggle over living labor. And actually if you go and look at the Taylor experience, it was a failure one after the other, until First World War, which was a kind of solidarity of all together because of the external enemies. When Ford came with the, uh, what is the English name, uh, conveyor, conveyor belt, conveyor belt, he in he incorporated a lot of this uh, innovation. He had to resist the, the resistance of workers, also to higher wages, etc. Uh, but he changed the. There was progress. There was technical progress. There was the changing of, of, of the structure of the factory. It was not only higher intensity. It was higher intensity through also an increase in the productive power of labor. It was much more powerful in uh, in my way. This created the conditions of a realization crisis in the late 20s. Because it gives way to an increase in the rate of surplus value, uh, the increase in the rate of surplus value was uh, in a way already uh, countered through, at a certain point, bubbles uh, of, of, of many kinds. Crisis always starts as financial crisis, but then uh, the, the, the potential lack of effective demand was, was there. So I interpret the crisis of the 30s as a realization crisis. Since I can use the name, the, 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 which is usual now, the Great Depression, because I use the Great Depression for the other, I use the term the Great Crash that I take from the book There were many answers to the Great Crash. One is the New Deal. It was an important answer. I leave it aside. Probably I may say something tomorrow. The New Deal was not Keynesian. Another legend is that the New Deal was Keynesian. It was not Keynesian if we mean for Keynesian the uh, 
deficit financing. Roosevelt was against deficit financing. That's why in 37 he blocked, 37-38 blocked it. The New Deal was less than Keynes from this point of view, but was more than Keynes from another point of view. Uh, not because Roosevelt was good because of the import of the crisis, but also because there was the push of social conflicts from below. It was a situation in which the state intervened in, in uh, the economy, providing directly demand, defining the composition of, of output, and employing directly workers. Mm -hmm. So it was a kind of huge experiment in what Keynes would later would have called socialization investment, but it was socialization investment on a much more radical way than Keynes thought and wrote in the last chapter, or almost last chapter, of the general theory. And it was a kind of socialization of, uh, of uh, employment. If you take an author like Minsky, of which I say something tomorrow, today I think I will not go very much into the last part because it is very much similar to what I say tomorrow. If you take an author like Minsky, what he says very much comes from Keynes as a financial economist, but it also very much comes from the New Deal because it is a kind of putting together the two things because Minsky was there at the time. Minsky, by the way, was a socialist at the beginning. He was an anti-Stalin, an anti-Lenin socialist. I think he, at his school, he even built some kind of uh, socialist young uh, center. He was in the American Socialist Party. This, uh, this movement he built, he built was taken over by a Leninist. I think this may be another reason for his hate of, <laughs> of Lenin and, uh, and Leninists. But he, if you go and read John Minor Keynes, the book of 75, and go into the last two chapters, the one on, fi on philosophy, you find socialism there. He, he has a very radical, uh, radical uh, proposal, which he himself defined as a socialist. He does not do that anymore in uh, the book of 86, even though I think the substance does not change very much. But in 75, he has no fear of calling it socialist, referring positively to Sweezy and, uh, and, uh, and the like. There were other answers to the great crash. These other answers, as we know, were Nazism, and where I leave aside for the moment USSR. And it was the other, the other important answer was World War II. We went out from the Great Crash through World War II. All the great golden age as it is defined, golden age for capital, 45, early 70s, was not a golden age for in my interpretation, was not a class compromise. What we take as the good things of the golden age came through struggles in the 60s and 70s, when that era was actually exploding. <laughs> uh, the, it was a, an incredible rise in the rate of growth and the rate of investment because of the huge destruction of capital due to the crisis itself. And on this, Matic was right, of the huge destruction of, uh, uh, of capital because of the war. And again, on this, uh, he, was, he was right. He was wrong in not recognizing the fact that there was this, this kind of Luxembourg through Kaleski mechanism. That is, the idea of Luxembourg is you go out of the crisis thanks to net exports towards a non-capitalist area. Kaleski said, well, but the non-capitalist area may be 
provided by the state through government deficits and in some papers it says also mortally financed. So you have an inflow of money, of money uh, through this. And I think Matic was wrong in not seeing this. He saw, however, an important thing in my story. You know, sometimes you, you build your thinking and forget the sources. And I'm sure that here there, is, there are a lot of ideas I stole from others, so the originality is the way I put them together, and the errors I do. I have this idea that if you start from a small deviation, error or whatever, and you are coherent, you may become an original thing. <laughs> you know? So my originality, I think, comes from a mechanism at the beginning. I, I, I never thought I had an original idea, and I don't know if I actually I have ever had a truly original idea. Uh, I think, since I, I, I worked again on Matic after 30 years that I read it, maybe more, after I've written this, I think the idea here comes from him. And the idea is the following. A lot or some of the production uh, raised by capitalism to affect the demand was production. But it was not capitalist production. As you know, Matic was politically Luxembourgian, but theoretically not. No? All these Luxembourgians went to Grossman and the falling rate of profit. As you know, Rosa Luxemburg somewhere, I think in the introduction to political economy, writes that the falling rate of profit story is a stupidity. She does not believe in it uh, anyhow. But this idea that investment that is the solution, it must be capitalist investment, is important for both. The most Keynesian, before Keynes, part of the commercial capital is the part of militarism for Luxembourg. And why? Because that kind of effective demand could allow for capitalist investment, that is, investment exploiting labor to having new surplus value, etc. And for Luxembourg was a solution because the goods, the commodities which were produced, were not going into anymore the process of reproduction. So it was productive labor, but as some authors in the 70s wrote, not in Italy, not reproductive labor, meaning labor entering again in the reproduction of capital. It was the solution of the duality or to the problem that duality, duality of investment gives for effective demand. Investment is demand, and it is addition to uh, capacity. Here you have the good side, demand, but not the bad side from, from the, for the rate of profit. Now, I think that uh, the point of, uh, of uh, Matic was right. That is, look, this demand raised, this is my translation, I would not say this way, raised the profit rate, it will say no, because it is not accounted for that, but it creates a problem. The problem is that this, this thing is sustainable only if the rate of exploitation over the directly productive workers goes up and up and up. So if you see all the, the crises, the, the, seven, the Great Depression, the Great Crash, and now the crisis of the 70s, goes all down to the increase of the rate of surplus value. Be why I say the crisis of the 70s? Because in my view, the crisis of poor fortune in the 70s, actually I would say that the crisis of, of forces began since the, the mid-60s. There was a period, mid-60s, early 70s, for many reasons, intra-capitalist competition, financial reasons, but a very important point, a crucial point, in my view, the key point was that capital was not able anymore to extract enough surplus value from workers. But this not in the meaning of the traditional rate 
or surplus, sorry, falling rate of profit story. This time it happened because they were not able to win or to win enough the class struggle in production. Workers were able to resist the needed increase in exploitation. Uh, so, I'm near the end of what I want to say this evening. So, if you see, we have used all the elements until now. We have used the falling rate of profit story in a traditional way in, uh, for the Great uh, Depression. The realization crisis for the late 20s and the 30s. We have come back to a capital labor confrontation, as in the profit squeeze idea, but not only or mainly in distribution. In distribution, but more so in uh, direct valorization process. The three things together may be seen as a kind of uh, redefined falling rate of profit story. Because paradoxically, what I'm saying is that you cannot divorce the tendencies from the counter tendencies. In a sense, what I'm saying is that, yes, the counter tendencies are weak. But when they win, they reassert sooner or later the tendency itself. So the, re the realization crisis is the counter comes from the counter tendency to the traditional falling rate of profit, but in the end it cannot go on forever, that reaction. So you have the realization crisis. And the answer to the realization crisis, since you are not going outside capitalism, creates the condition of a new crisis, and so on and on. So I think that you can't have a Marxian theory of the crisis, which does not start logically from the folio rate of profit. Otherwise, you are not able to locate, in my view, the realization crisis and what I call the social crisis of, of the 70s. Uh, just two things to close. The second part, the one which is not in, in, in the Italian uh, paper for the Jesuit, just because I have no time, no, no, no words, uh, and you must have to cut somewhere, is that they say, look, why I am able to, to say this? Because the class struggles in Italy in the late 60s, early 70s, were paradigmatic. That is, they, they, they showed in a clear, clearer way than elsewhere what was going on. And in my view, the capitalism, the crisis of monopoly capitalism, was showing uh, the elements for this interpretation. In my view, Matic was a good theorist for the Great Depression, Sweezy was a good theorist for the for the Great Crash, they gave important help to analyze the new form of capitalism uh, in the monopoly capital uh, age, but they were not able to really understand the key reason of the crisis in the, uh, in the 70s. Then I have the last part of the paper. The last part of the paper is on neoliberalism, and on this I will come back tomorrow. I just give you the abstract, and the abstract is this. In my view, neoliberalism is not, is a new form of capital corporation. My idea is that if you want to understand the crisis of capitalism, you have to first ask which kind of capitalism went into crisis. Because the crisis is not the crisis of some asphyctic uh, or weak or feeble capitalism, it's always the crisis of certain contradictions of capitalism as an expanding uh, mode of production. So I do not buy the idea that neoliberalism was weak and feeble because it was 
dumped by the underconsumption tendencies because the wage share was going down, which is the most diffused idea. Uh, the distribution problem is low wages and distribution a problem? Yes, it is a problem, but it's not the reason of the, the crisis. I don't buy the idea that it was uh, a crisis because of the falling rate of profit. I agree with most of the supporters of the interpretation of the crisis of the 70s as the falling rate of profit, who says that actually the rate of profit has recovered uh, almost entirely since 80 uh, on. <coughs> What I'm saying is that neoliberalism is uh, a phase in which capital was able to destroy the condition of the strength of the workers uh, in the 70s through two legs. One leg was uh, the fragmentation of labor, linked to what I call a new era that I call the centralization without concentration of work. And the other leg was the subordinate inclusion of workers and households uh, into finance. So what I call the real subsumption of labor to finance, where finance means stock exchange, means uh, housing as a, as a kind of financial asset, means uh, uh, bank debt, and, uh, and so on. This mechanism is linked to the perverse finance, what is called financialization, which is for me is a too generic term. But uh, uh, the point is that exactly the perfect per perverse aspects of finance are those which helps to explain how capital was able to exploit, exploit workers and to find for itself effective demand because it created the conditions for longer working hours, uh, higher intensity of, uh, of labor, certain kind of technological uh, change increasing productive power of labor, so new forms of old exploitation, not new exploitation, new forms of old exploitation. I don't agree, as some of my friends think I do, with La Pavizas, that there is a new exploitation. No, no, exploitation for me is coming from there. But once you have this, you have to sell the commodities. And they have been able to sell the commodities. So my question is, from where? Since not really through a Keynesian in history, meaning uh, public expenditure as an active element. This was not the story. Not, of course, higher wage consumers. I, do, I don't buy that story, but that, of course, cannot be, cannot be there. Not net exports from the world. And areas, some areas of the world could have net exports. Japan, Europe. By the way, those who went really into stagnation since the 90s. So, from where? Investment. I think that investments has been alive. If you look at investment from the side of effective demand, you may say reasonably, oh, it's not, it's not being very high. If you look at investment from the side of production and the workers, there has been a lot of innovation. So you have to put the two things together. And in my view, this story fits with, with my idea that investment is devaluating cost and capital. There has been a period in which investment has been alive and kicking for some areas. In my view, investment, however, in neoliberalism, has not productive investment. It has not been able to close the monetary circle. So, from where the monetary system was closed, it was closed through a new kind of autonomous demand, which is consumption demand, through indebted uh, consumption, which has been actually commanded by a new economic policy, active economic policy, monetary policy, 
from central banks, especially Anglo-Saxon uh, countries. This I call privatized Keynesianism. I mean Keynesian, meaning it is a politically produced demand. They never forgot this, never went. But at the same time, it is privatized because it goes through privatization, of course, but also through monetary policy uh, and not fueling the capital Toporovsky, the capital uh, market inflation, no? the inflation of capital assets. It is a completely new mechanism. It has been a mechanism very, very uh, efficient for a while, it is a mechanism, however, which went under through its own contradiction. In my view, this crisis started in 2000, actually not in 2007. It was delayed by the supreme phenomenon, and at a certain point it ended into the so-called Great, Great Recession, on which there was the superimposition of the European crisis. I stop. Thank you so much for excellent and thought-provoking lecture. I, I don't think we should have any difficulties di uh, continuing the discussion now, so the floor is open for questions. Would you like some water? Yes, it yeah. would be wonderful. Yeah. Okay. okay, can I start? Uh, I have, I mean, I have lots of questions, but uh, first of all, uh, I would start with one concerning the uh, tendential fall, uh, tendential fall in the rate of profit. So. Uh, you basically seem to have a, a notice that uh, the uh, rate of profit is kind of a indeterminate, so you cannot say it will fall or rise. Uh, I mean, you at least cannot deduce its tendency uh, uh, on a rather, I don't know, this abstract logical level. I mean, of course, you can observe the fluctuations empirically. And so, but, okay, one of uh, your arguments was that, uh, of course, uh, the rising technical composition of capital due to uh, increases in uh, productivity will, of course, uh, produce a tendency for the uh, organic composition of capital to rise. However, uh, there will be a counter tendency of uh, basically devaluation of individual units of constant capital due to the same dynamics. So uh, you basically claim that there is no uh, way of us to tell will this uh, increase uh, in productivity actually uh, lead to a rise in value uh, composition of capital, but okay, there was one uh, objection to this objection made by uh, Giulielmo Carcedi, who said that okay, of course you can have, uh, you, I mean, of course this can result in a decline in value of constant capital, however, dynamics, uh, if you basically take into consideration the general rise in productivity will lead to a devaluation of variable capital. Uh, so you won't stop the tendency of the variable capital to basically decline and therefore also you won't stop the tendency of the surplus value uh, in the nominator of the uh, profit rate equation to, to fall. Uh, okay, there's also another uh, uh, thing. Okay, you, you also said that there's uh, basically no way to prove that the rate of uh, surplus value uh, will uh, basically rise uh, I know to a smaller, uh, uh, I mean, to a smaller degree than the organic composition of uh, capital. I mean, of course, okay. There is. Uh, uh, I mean, I tend to actually agree with uh, with that. Uh, it's just, uh, I don't. Know, okay, uh, we could say, of course, uh, if you increase uh, productivity, then uh, okay, you will have a rise in uh, organic composition of capital. Uh, as well as the rise in the rate of surplus value. Uh, okay, uh, of course, uh, okay, Marx uh, tries to show that, uh, I know, uh, the rise in organic uh, composition of capital will prevail due to the fact that the mass of, uh, the rise in the mass of surplus value is uh, limited. Of course, this can be uh, shown by an example. For example, Michael Heinrich does that uh, in his book. So, okay, uh, you have, uh, I know, 24 workers uh, 
with, you have an industry with 24 workers employed, each of them performs two hours of surplus labor a day, so therefore in a day they produce 48 uh, hours of, or they perform 48 hours of surplus value. However, if, if you reduce the, those numbers of workers substantially due to the uh, basically uh, adoption of labor saving technology, if you reduce the number of, of workers to two, of course two of them will never be able to produce 48 hours of surplus labor a day. Uh, so, uh, okay, th there is a certain limit to the rise of, uh, okay, surplus value and therefore also to the rate of uh, exploitation. But, okay, however, then Heinrich makes a counter uh, argument basically that this uh, 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 context will only lead to a certain uh, decline in the rate of profit only if we presuppose that the total capital advanced will remain constant. But this same uh, basically case uh, that was put forward to show that there's a uh, uh, the, basically that there's a limitation to the rise of uh, surplus value shows that there, uh, it also implies the reduction of the value of variable capital because if you, I don't know, if you come from 24 workers to two workers then uh, the, the variable capi capital will be 12 times uh, smaller and if you also take into consideration the rise in the rate of surplus, uh, okay, no, uh, if you take into consideration the depreciation of the means of consumption, then this means that, okay, variable capital will tend to fall even lower. So, okay, uh, this leads to a sharp reduction of the total capital advance, which pushes, pushes basically the uh, uh, profit rate uh, up. Uh, however, uh, the, the same argument uh, I put forth for the first uh, case, could it maybe be used also for this case? So, okay, of course, there can be, I mean, this decline of variable capital on the long run will still, uh, on, will still basically uh, uh, result in the decline of uh, surplus value. So maybe, okay, you can have this uh, uh, work of these counter tendencies uh, if we were to call them that, but they won't stop uh, the fall in the profit rate on the long run. I mean, okay, also. Some more questions, but maybe, okay. <laughs> yes. Other questions? I will get some. Okay, uh, I have one question, uh, a more empirical. You said, I mean, I don't see how your account uh, doesn't fit in with the uh, tendency of the profit rate to fall. Um, uh, you said that at the end of the 60s, uh, there was a struggle, I mean, there is always a struggle between workers and capitalists, and uh, the latter, the capitalists, uh, just couldn't extract enough surplus value uh, from the workers, so that ensued um, uh, the private debt accumulation, and so the crisis uh, began. Uh, I don't see how uh, you couldn't integrate that view into the falling rate of uh, profit, the view uh, put forward by Freeman and Kleiman and Kirkedi, Roberts and others, because um, they argue a, a similar thing. I mean, especially Roberts, uh, he says, contra Lapovitsas uh, and Dumanil, um, that, okay, even if we assume um, that the profit rate did uh, rebound uh, in the neoliberal uh, period, but I think that uh, Andrew Kleinman makes uh, an, irre an irrefutable case that it didn't, uh, not on empirical data, but because you have to use historic cost, not current cost. And I mean, if you could uh, shed light on that, uh, I didn't see how you could use current cost um, uh, pricing. Uh, so um, even if it did rebound, so what? I mean, it produced the crisis, the falling uh, rate of profit. And yes, then the counter tendency, the credit accumulation, as Marx put it uh, in the third volume, uh, can can uh, be the counter tendency for many years, and then ultimately the tendency asserts itself, and uh, a, a great crisis manifests itself, like uh, the Great Recession. So, if you could uh, maybe talk about that, why uh, don't you fully agree with the traditional uh, view um, in the case of the 70s and the 80s? Uh, for for example, why don't, why don't you agree with uh, Kleinman, uh, Roberts, and uh, others? Um, why do you uh, invoke that? Uh, Keynesian, uh, privatized Keynesian. Um, I, I just didn't understand it uh, uh, thoroughly enough. I, I, I'm sure you explained it. Um, that would be it for, for now. Yeah. Other questions? 
questions? Maybe it would be best for you to answer these two long Please questions one. now. Because <laughs> As you wish. First, I answer a question which has not been done because it is preliminary. So I do a question to myself. Uh, I said at a certain point that uh, I have objections in the generic way that labor is used in Marxism, and uh, that I think it, that is important. And in my view, my objections come exactly from the experience of the 60s and 70s as I see it. as I see it as a, as a theoretician, but also as I experienced it as a young person in social movements. I may, I may hear a quote that is also in the research in political economy from an interview to a worker which was done in the late 60s uh, and which has been uh, published in 88. It was done for the Corriere della Sera, but the Corriere della Sera didn't publish it. It was a series of interviews with workers. If I find it, it is, should be here. Uh, This worker, Sergio Gaudenti, says, I want to explain the key points of these struggles. He's referring to the struggles at Fiat 60, 69, 70, 71. I think it was 69, actually, the, the, the interview, so those struggles. Uh, the, the wild strikes, uh, the contractual struggle that Fiat uh, tried to, to stop suspending 30,000 workers. The master, with the wage, thinks he can buy uh, the worker as it can be bought a kilo of apples. You sell them and they pay you. After, I consume you as I wish. The apple, I can cut it, I can put it on the fire, I can uh, let it go and uh, to waste. I can eat it if I wish. The destiny of the commodity is, in fact, that to be consumed. But the worker is a very special kind of commodity. It is not enough for it to be sold at a good price. It does not want any more to be consumed as workers like. It is a commodity, this one, that wants to have the power to control every day the way of its consumption. That is why now we are doing the internal struggles on work for workers' control. Now, let me go to the theoretical point. I think that Marx, when he arrived in capital, he uh, insisted on the distinction between labor power, labor, and workers. Labor power is the commodity that the workers sell to capital. It is Arbeitskraft in, uh, in German. It was Arbeitsvermögen, capacity to work before. Then there is labor, Arbeit. When Marx speaks of Arbeit in capital, in my view, he always is speaking of lebendige Arbeit, living labor, the activity which is extracted from labor power. Then there are the workers. The workers are the living bearers of labor power. And that is the key point. You can't 
just stop a distinction between labor power and living labor. You have to understand that labor power is attached physically to the living beers of labor power workers, and that when capital buys labor power, it has to take the workers inside the factory or the, 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 the working place, and that are the workers who have to work. So this is a very special kind of social relation. And this creates for capital problems which are completely different than any other problem that capital may have. In a sense, everything else can be included in capital, except this and nature. Now I use a term which is used by Chris Arthur, but actually I ended being very near, on a certain point even almost indistinguishable from Chris, just because I said the same thing before, because of, 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 of my religion. Chris used the term internal other. If capital is not able to internalize the living labor, the living bearers of labor power, it cannot produce new value and ends surplus value. Of course, capital is also an external other, which is nature, and there is a problem of rent, etc. Now, let us stop. So, when usually uh, Martians, or people talking on Mars, speak of Mars, they use labor and capital. Two people to whom I am very much indebted. One is Cardinal Napoleone, and the other was the Lucio Colletti of the end of the 60s and very early 70s. And this defect, as all the Italian left, but even, I assure you, practically every Marxist. I am one of them. You saw, when, when, I, when I speak, at a certain point, I say labor, and one has to get which kind of the three. Is. If one does not, does this distinction, one does not understand anything. And Radica, when there were this kind of, uh, of things, wanted to simplify in English, you know. But if you simplify me on this triadic dimension, the argument disappears. If some of you were in, uh, in uh, London for the historical materials, they know that on this kind of thing I also uh, build the relationship of continuity and discontinuity between Marx and Hegel. Now, in capital, what, what one sees of this is this argument. Take, take chapter 5, which is 7 in English. The worker has sold his labor power. The capitalist has the right to use it. There is no uh, injustice in this, and they follow Marx completely from this point of view. The capitalist wants to use the worker as living bearers of labor power. He has the right to do so. Uh, so it is like an apple. But Marx knows very well that it is not like an apple. If it is not like an apple, this means that every time capital has to win what Altus, not Althusser, Balibar called class struggle in production, which is always on both, on both sides, it has to extract living labor from a always potentially counterproductive labor. Even the best of Marxists either don't see or don't use this. 
take the great Lukács in Eastern and Class Consciousness. This thing is taken for granted. Take Sweezy, it is taken for granted valorization. Take Paulmatic. Take the authors that you have quoted. When we go into economics, it is something which is taken for granted. I think that you don't, you, it's a genetic, you understand anything if you stop taking this for granted. And Marx became a critique of political economy because there was a social reality before, that is, there were people starting in the early to, uh, 19th century questioning capital. The critique begins from there. This has to do with the answer to the second uh, question. None of the interpretations of the authors that you imported as the monthly review, uh, as the as the climate okay, insists on this. What, whatever is aside, it is not there. For me, it is not only crucial to read Marx. It is crucial because, of course, there were people seeing this before, probably on the fringe of the labor movement. Maybe it is my experience that I, you know, I felt impressed by this when, uh, when I, 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 I saw that. I think it was a great thing for my generation because I, I'm not so sure that other generations had this kind of possibility to be in contact with, uh, really, with workers, etc. But in my view, that was a kind of mass experience. And so I think that this must be there to understand the crisis from the late 60s and in the 70s. I agree completely that empirically uh, you can distinguish. You cannot distinguish. This is a problem for everybody. Here I agree with Paul Matic. Paul Matic Senior, Paul Matic Junior, the son. With uh, Radica and uh, Alan Freeman and he, we had a session a couple of years, three years ago, in historical material. And he presented a paper on, in which he said something which people like, uh, which makes crazy people like uh, Kleiman. That is, you can't uh, verify or put to test the falling rate profit story. Yes, because the data are completely on one side, unavailable. If are av 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 available, it is a, a great construction. Now, let, let us put two things. Realization crisis, struggles in the labor process. Realization crisis of the, or the effect of effective demand on value production. Of course, if there is a relatively low effective demand, there is less value production also less new value production, and this affects the numerator. If you have my social crisis, this affects the ability to extract the living labor, then the transformation into... And so again, how you from the data distinguish? Because if you take the capital income ratio, which is the one which was mostly, mostly used, on that you have all these elements together. So in my view, you can actually distinguish. Uh, I think there is a lot of interesting things on depth in the others you, you say. My, my problem with them, and here we go to the, to the first question, is more on the theoretical grounding. You know, there is, I, I have been I don't know if to say lucky enough to have been selected by the historical materialism for many years to be the discussant of choice for uh, Kleiman, for Mino, Kakedi, uh, and for Alan. Uh, so, you know, when, when you read 
read a paper because we were to do the discussant. You, you read it seriously. Uh, in one case, I had Alan as a discussant on a paper of mine. He used his 10 minutes to say, you have written between two commas that uh, the interpretation of um, the, the, uh, the economists uh, don't find errors in Marx's uh, transformation problem. And for a single system interpretation. I am for a single system, but not in that way. But however, uh, that was his contestation. And it was an absolutely minor point in my paper. It was not discussed in my paper. So my answer to a 10 minutes comment was, ah, yes, I will not say the economists, but for the majority of the economists, there is an error that we have to discuss and see that. Uh, I, I don't remember the same occasion. I had to discuss a paper of uh, uh, Andrew. Andrew has a peculiar methodological interpretation according to which you can say scientifically that you are not putting forward any interpretation, but that you are just the voice of the author. I made a sophisticated rebuttal of this in my view, referring to the debate, because you, you just can put outside of the thing altogether. Uh, and at the same time, his view was that is then the author, and I don't think that you can say that, you can say this is the author of my interpretation, and then there is the empirical reality and a test, because the argument is we are putting forward this is Marx, and we are not saying that Marx is right. Then we go and check with the reality. This seems to me some kind of crude uh, neopositivism, but let us let us leave aside. Why I arrived through this long thing? Because I had to discuss another time Mino Carcheri, a paper, I think he has published it, on the uh, falling rate of profit. There he said, there is, this is the falling rate of profit according to Marx. This is the criticism according to Suisi. Then literally he went on says, well, maybe Suisi is right. But then one has to choose. Either Marx or Suisi. We go to reality, and reality uh, confirms, uh, confirms, uh, confirms Marx. Hmm? Uh, in my view, the point about the devaluation of cost and capital must be taken at the theoretical level. You have the devaluation of all the commodities. On one side, it, raise, it may raise the rate of surplus value. On the other side, it may decrease the um, composition of, of capital. For me, the argument on the devaluation of cost and capital is crucial because it is the one which allows to reject the most important argument in favor of the tendency of the rate of profit to fall, which is the one about the maximum rate of profit. On the other, yes, I say, I cannot say anything determinate if it is going up or it is going down. The second argument seems to say something definite in the end, it does not. But please, yeah, I understand that my argument may be crazy, but I am not saying, I'm saying the traditional way of reading Marx doesn't work, but I'm not saying that it is irrelevant from where you start. Because if you start from my idea of labor as a very complex thing, huh, which is a capital relation, capital and workers, workers as bearers of labor power, labor power which must be extracted, this social relation has to go necessarily through 
through competition, but not only because of competition, because of the capital relation, has to go towards the uh, higher and higher extraction of living labor, which requires more uh, technical composition of capital. So that, has, that must be the starting point. The fact that it does not allow us to say the rate of profit is going up, the rate of profit is going down, it is later on down the road. But that must be the, the point, because the crucial contradiction has to do with the ability or not of capital to extract living labor so that valorization goes on in a definite amount. As soon as I say this, I say that the others are counter-tendencies, even if they win. And as soon as I say they win, I am then interested in how they interact with the tendency and what are the new contradictions. No? So that's why I'm saying I think this is in the labor theory value. I think this maintain the crucial contradiction of capital. This refers to the social spatial reality of capital, even though I don't say that there is a necessity in going up or down on the rate of profit. Yes, of course, here there is another point of my my, my point is there will always be crisis. There is no capitalism without crisis. In a sense, was right Paul Paul Matty when he said capitalism is permanent crisis. But this does not mean collapse. Hmm? So the end of capital, in my way of thinking, will never be asserted only through objective reason, nor through wild subjectivism. In many, for example, the Negri argument are of that kind. No, no, no. It is a social relation in which the objective side and the and, and this, the, 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 the subjective side, so to speak, are both essential. I have to look at how they move. And I can't say anything before, if not, that there will be a movement of contradictions that I have to study specifically. So yes, I have no one-way tendency of the rate of profit. I have the production of contradictions through a tendencies which has counter tendencies uh, that even when they win, uh, they create new contradictions and they all pass through the bodies of workers. Because, as, as the worker says, but it is in capital. The only way capital can valorize is through consuming workers and consuming the bodies of the workers. Maybe he was also, you know, he appears as a worker, maybe he was a very cultured worker, but he was able to, to, to nail, uh, to nail the, the point. Uh, I think I agree, I've read it, but I don't remember the details, with, with the way Michael Heinrich uh, put, uh, put the thing. It, it, it seems to me a good way of saying, yes, this is possible, but this requires some things. It, it, it does not put into the account. I am very much in agreement with many, many, many of the things that Michael Heinrich says. I try, uh, you know, in, in Marxism there are those who stress circulation. Uh, as the as the way as the locus of the creation of value, there are those who stress production. Uh, I think that both ideas are wrong. I think that Michael is going too much towards the circulationist view. I think that both are wrong because value is created in the uh, intersection, so to speak of the two things. At the same time, and that's why I have that, that kind of strange interpretation also of Hegel, in Marx it is essential of going from production to circulation. This is not so easy as it seems, you know, because uh, 
since the beginning Marx knows that uh, uh, that production is immersed in circulation so even in the first book of capital you don't start from production no? so you have always the, the two things together then now how you can say that production is before circulation and this is another uh, another kind of, of problematic but I think that that, that point is crucial, is important. No? My game actually, and that's why I'm interested in a certain kind of uh, circuitous and post keynesian dimension, is that we have to distinguish two, two different kinds of circulation. One is the circulation on which Marx definitely put a lot of accent, which is the general circulation of commodities. When commodities are produced, uh, and that's at the beginning of capital. And it it must be there, of course, because you, you, you can't start uh, presupposing that production, production is, is done and is there, etc. But that's one thing. But then, before you have production, you, you, you have the production of value, but that production of value has circulation before, not only after. Because that production of value before has the buying and selling of labor power. And, and that's, a, in my view, logically, it is a different kind of circulation. The capital relation, meaning the relation of capital with workers, is at the same time a production relation and a circulation relation. And it is a very specific circulation relation. Now, a lot of the heterodoxies of the 70s and 80s and 90s have insisted on this on the wage side. You know, saying this is true of, of especially of French authors, but not all. Saying the problem is for workers the fact that they are dominated by by the wage. You know? so all the stress is going towards that kind of situation. That, that's not good either. I think that we have to stress the priority of the capital-labor relation, which is finance to buy workers the wage, the money wage, etc., and production. And this is an argument. In my view, the argument of the first book of capital. Hmm? And later on, you have the general exchange of commodities, where this is the, or the argument about the general equivalent. You may see my perspective as putting more stress than Marx did no, on this circulation within the capital labor relation huh, and reducing the stress that, that he and most Marxists have on the general equivalent uh, side, etc. This is of course because I very much stress the macro dimension of the capital labor relationship. You know. When you go into the general equivalent, you are not anymore in the macro dimension. Maybe you are the exchange of one commodity against the other. You are more in the general economic equilibrium, the equivalent of a general economic equilibrium system. That's it. Any I think I killed you. I see this cousin. <laughs> <laughs> Two hours are gone. <laughs> Any other questions? Otherwise, we'll be able to continue tomorrow night. Uh, last yeah. chance? No. Okay. So thank you again, and see you tomorrow.